together on seclosounds.org Airline fees airport internet Holiday to people who can't afford it, and Christmas markets. That's all coming up on the John Gwynn Travel Show on seclosounds.org. Hello and welcome to the John Gwynn Travel Show on seclosounds.org. It's a real picker mix of a show this week on the Travel Show. In a moment I'll be talking about airline fees and trying to do your best to reduce them by using airport internet facilities. We'll be speaking to Ledger Holidays about Christmas markets. I know it's only August. I know it's still summer holidays. But if you want to get a good deal, you've got to start planning ahead. We'll also be talking about the new BBC report on fines for parents taking children out of school. And also we're hearing from the Family Holiday Association who help people who can't afford to get away to have a, at least a short break somewhere in the UK. And that's all coming up on the Travel Show today. You spent ages researching and you found a flight with a great price and now it's the day you're flying. After queuing for what seems like ages, you've got finally got to the front of the queue and you're now checking in. Then smack! you hit across the cheeks with a fee for checking in at the airport. Whack! You've been hit by another fee for your luggage. Low-cost airlines say that they're keeping prices down but sometimes it seems this way as they've swapped a traditional f- ticket for a menu of various items that used to be included in the price and are now optional. Recently I met a couple at Luton Airport who had the surprise gift from their airline of an extra £151 in fees. Technically, it was their own fault for not paying attention to the sales rules set by their airline, but it wasn't the time or place to say that because they were really quite upset about it especially as they realise that they're going to be hit again on the flight back. The reason is they were staying in a remote cabin with no internet, so they couldn't check in online before coming back. They're going to have to go through the whole procedure again. So I offered the only advice I could, which was suggest that they find a business centre at the destination airport before they left for the cabin, and then they can get back to the airport in time to use the business centre to check in online, sort the luggage out, and it'd be a lot less than paying the airline. So the airline's saying they're keeping prices down and they're good for the customer. But all these stories about airport fees, I've yet to come across a story where the check-in staff suggest that the passenger uses the airport's internet booth or kiosk to actually print out the ticket and save a lot of money. But no, they just sit there and ask for the credit card details. To be fair, Ryanair, who are traditionally knocked for their pricing, have brought down the price of a boarding card, so they are beginning to become more customer-focused. But what are the fines that catch passengers out? Well, let's start with Wizz Air. A baggage fee at the airport per flight, per passenger, per bag is £51. And at the airport means check-in and at the gate, so you might forget to check in and go through security to have your luggage you'd be surprised how many people do this they get to the airport through security and just don't check in and then they have to they ask them to go back through security to go to the check-in desk to check in their bag and in most cases they can't do that but of course they can check it at the gate if your hand luggage is too large then it's another 30 pounds and the airport check-in fee for Wizz Air Per flight, for per flight, per passenger is £25. And now for Ryanair. If you haven't got your boarding card, it's only £15 now to have that printed. However, checking in at the airport is £70 per person, per flight. Of course, finding a way around these fees by using the airport's internet uh, kiosks doesn't really help if there's a time limit set on what the online check-in is. 
With Ryanair, you can only check in online up to two hours before the flight time. So this could be why a Ryanair check-in desk doesn't recommend that the passenger uses the kiosk, because they're too late. With Wizz Air, you can't check in after three hours before the departure time, so you really have to get there early to be able to do it. So, these airlines are both trying really hard to get those last-minute fees off passengers, aren't they? So, as I've said many times before over the last couple of years of this show, always be certain about the flight ticketing rules before you hand over your money. But if you're OCD like me about checking in, then you're going to be at the airport in plenty of time for a last-minute online uh, ticketing action. So, how do you find out if your departure airport has the facilities to allow you to do this? Well, the first step, as always, is the airport's website. I did this, and it doesn't always help. You could message them using their contact facilities to ask, but again, I've tried that, and it doesn't always work. But luckily, most airports in the UK are members of a group, so if your chosen airport ignores your email, then perhaps another one from the group will actually answer you and you've got a good chance of finding out what's at the actual airport you're going to be using. I hope that makes sense. So, by using other airports to in a group to respond to other airports, that's how I got my nearly complete list of uh, airports in this, this little report. So, airports with printing facilities... It's Birmingham. Oh, these airports are all the ones used by Ryanair and Wizz Air. So I haven't covered every UK airport, just the one with these two low-cost, no-frills airlines. So it's again, start again. We have printing facilities. There's Birmingham, Cardiff, Edinburgh, Gatwick, Glasgow, Leeds, and Liverpool. The kiosks here are run by Surfbox, who were actually far more helpful than most of the airports in giving me the answers. Surfbox say that they... Uh, the cost of the internet is 10p per minute and printing is £1 per page. So they say for £2 you could check in online, which is considerably cheaper than the £15 for Ryanair and uh, quite a bit better than £25 for Wizz Air. Then Bristol and Luton also have it. Uh, with Luton, the I haven't got the prices for Bristol. It was a airport in the, the group. But Luton, internet desks are available for £1 for 10 minutes and they're situated nearby the door of arrivals. So if you're on departures, you're not going to see it. But if you've landed and you're leaving the airport, you'll be walking past the kiosk on your way out. So maybe the thinking was people might want to do some last minute printing for maps to where they're going. Maybe you would have been better off in the departures. But anyway, it's by the departures door. And it's £1 per page at the various print spots in the terminal building. Uh, Stansted, uh, they have internet kiosk and printing facilities available for a fee, but I hadn't f been able to find out what that fee is. Uh, some airports with internet but without printing facilities. There's the airport which is known as Doncaster, Sheffield or Robin Hood, three names, one airport, and Presswick in Scotland. And uh, an airport has come back to me and said they don't have any internet facilities for people who don't have their own smartphone. That was Newcastle Airport. And I'm still waiting to know from a few airports if they offer Wi-Fi kiosks or booze. They do offer free Wi-Fi for your smartphone or your laptop or your tablet. But again, this report was trying to help people who didn't have access to that. So there's Bournemouth, East Midlands, Manchester and Londonderry slash Derry. Of all the airports I contacted, one airport did suggest that passengers could use their smartphone app, but that kind of ignored the question I sent to them, saying, how can you help people who don't have a smartphone check in when they get to the airport? But never mind, thanks anyway. So what's your experience of airport fees from your airline this year? Have you received help in reducing the costs from a member of the airline staff? Or have you just had to pay up? Let me know via facebook.com slash John Gwynn Travel Show. And also, while we're on the subject, what have your, what's been your experience of internet facilities at UK airports? Let me know at facebook.com slash John Gwynn Travel Show. Jerry,
Gary Fitz here, every Monday, 10 o'clock. Coming up, we've got Eric and Ernie. Bring me Join me here on Seclo Sounds. In your smile. It's from 1975, Bring Eric and Ernie laughter. were four... Uh, uh, Gary, Gary, uh, it's what? not Eric and Ernie, it's Earl and Ernie, you know, uh, the Cape Brothers, Union Man. Oh, I see. Gary Fitz here, every Monday, 10 o'clock. Earl and Ernie. You're listening to the John Gwynn Travel Show on seclosounds.org. You may think that these optional extra airline fees are a European thing, but they're not. Budget slash low cost slash no frills airlines around the world have fees that will make a lawyer blush. Here are a few that were recently listed in an ABC news story. Number one, the $100 carry-on fee. Spirit Airlines charges $100, which is about £60, each way for a carry-on bag if you don't pay for it until you get to the gate. You can book it online for £18, or if you book it when you get into the check-in desk, it's £21. There's the $200 change fee. Uh, Most flight tickets have a heavy change fee. American, Delta and US Airways charges around about £120 for a change per ticket. This change can be for changing the day, the time, or even correcting a misspelt name. To be honest, I don't know why the Americans for this story are getting that upset about it. Over here in the UK, Virgin Atlantic charges £100 for any plus any price increase in the cost of the ticket. In some cases, the changes may even mean paying extra for the ticket, as the flight is more expensive on the new day you want to go to than when you originally booked. Or maybe the price has gone up and all the cheap seats you bought months ago have now gone. You've got to get to the next more expensive range. So can you imagine spelling the name incorrectly and being charged £150 to change the name and then being told you need to pay an extra £80 as the ticket's now more expensive today? So to get round this, consider refundable tickets. If you're unsure about your dates you want to fly on and they may not work out for you, then either wait until you're 100% certain what days you want to fly or buy a refundable ticket, but it won't be cheap. A non-flexible Virgin Atlantic return ticket from Gatwick to Cancun is £700 and a flexible one is nearly £2,000. So you have to work out whether the fees are are just worth throwing the ticket away and booking again or paying the extra for a refundable. So let's for the look at the rules of the cheaper cheap, the cheaper seven hundred pound ticket. It says here the changes at any time charge a hundred pounds. Notes before departure on the outburn journey for changes made prior to the departure of the scheduled flight, reprice using current fares. After departure of the outbound journey, outbound journey for changes made prior to the departure of the scheduled flight, reprice using fares in effect at the time of the original ticket issue. Need another breath now. No show. The changes made after the departure of the original scheduled ticket charge £150 and reprice using the current or historical fares as above. Infants, no penalty. Retrice as above. Children, no discounts as ply as per adult. Waiver. Death, illness of a passenger or immediate family member as evidence, I spell evidence wrong, which is very bad, by a death or hospital certificate. Keep the original fare and rebook as required. Upgrades. Prior to the departure, the original scheduled flight may be upgraded to a higher cabin without penalty. Another breath. Reprice using the current or historical fares as above. Resulting fare must be equal or higher than the original fare. Residue amounts. No refund to be given if repricing results in a lower fare. So there you go. If it costs more, you have to pay more. If it costs less, too bad. Multiple changes. Apply the highest charge for all fare components within a pricing unit regardless of whether that fare component has changed. Cancellations at any time, ticket is non-refundable. So go on, be honest, how many of you read all this before you give your credit card details out when you read a flight? As I've mentioned numerous times, always check the fare rules before you hand over the money, make sure you're happy. Of course, you could check to see if your travel insurance will cover you. Not always possible, but you never know. But if it does cover you for flight changes, it may not cover you for spelling somebody's name right. 
well, wrong and getting it right, if you know what I mean. Or you could just get on your knees at the check-in desk and beg for mercy. The third fare brought up by the AABC story was overweight fee. And to be honest, I've actually been caught out on this one before, as when I was on a tourist board trip to the Cayman Islands, I know, it's a tough life, I brought back too much information to share with my clients and I took me over the uh, the weight limit. So here's a hint, helpful hint, always have a pocket scale so you can check your suitcase before you get to the airport. But if you think it costs you too much to get your suitcase on an air on the airplane in the first place a high, you wait until you go over your weight limit. If on America Delta in America, if you take a seventy one pound suitcase, that's weight, not cost, uh you have to pay hundred and twenty pounds each way on top of the checked in fee. And sometimes on an international flight, United charges overweight fees as high as two hundred and forty pounds. There was a an American travel expert who's on a lot of uh, American TV programs and in the papers and he got caught out by EasyJet with his luggage fees he saw that he could take a few cases pay extra for extra cases on the EasyJet flight he assumed that he could take 20 kilograms per suitcase no it was six suitcases weighing a total of 20 kilograms cost him more to get from the England, London to Amsterdam than it did to get him from America to England in the first place He's never flying with that airline again, and he's telling everybody all about it. And the last fee mentioned by ABC is the phone fee. No, that's not a fee for using your phone on the flight, but a fee for talking to somebody. Do you need to talk to somebody, get something sorted on your flight ticket, but you're away from a computer, or perhaps you just can't figure out the website? Well then, it's extra for you, my travelling friend. And this is on top of the price of the call, and the time it takes to the front of the queue. Um, according to ABC, airlines are charging up to $25 just for somebody on the end of a phone to do something for you. So, yes, it's the Facebook time again. Have you been caught out with airline fees when you've been abroad? Which country were you in? Which airline was it? And how much did it cost you? Share your story, facebook.com slash John Gwynn Travel Show. The Shuttleworth Collection presents the tribute concert with classic hits from ABBA, Queen, Robbie Williams, Tina Turner and many more. Advanced tickets £25, available from shuttleworth.org forward slash tickets. Book for 10 or more for a 10% online discount. The tribute concert, Sunday, August 17 at the Shuttleworth Collection, Old Warden, Bedfordshire. You're listening to the John Green Travel Show on setclosesounds.org. Still to come on the show, that uh, latest BBC report about fines for parents, and also we're hearing from the Family Holiday Association. But this time last year, I spoke to Paul Materan, I think I pronounced that right, but he's going to pronounce it for himself in a minute, about Christmas holidays. Yes, as I said before, I know it's only August. But you need to plan ahead because some of these Christmas markets are very popular and get sold out quite early. If you want to make the most of a Christmas market, you need to do need to book ahead and plan ahead. And I was doing a an article for a travel trade magazine, so I combined the interview for the show and the uh, article for the travel magazine. So as it's raining outside and it's quite wintry, I thought it'd be ideal to sh- play this interview again. So here's Paul from Ledger Holidays to talk about Christmas markets. My name's Paul McTiernan. I'm the Operations Director of Ledger Holidays. Ledger Holidays being one of the, or the market leader in European coach touring. We're going to be talking about Christmas markets this morning. Can you please describe what a typical Christmas market is? Uh, Christmas markets have a unique festive atmosphere. Uh, have lots of stalls selling traditional gifts, um, most of them handmade uh, with the hustle and bustle the scent of local food and drinks. Uh, they're usually held in the market squares uh, with the backdrop of the town or city's unique uh, architectural style behind them, uh, often, the, as I say, the town hall or the cathedral. Which countries would qualify to have in a Christmas market? Oh, there are many of them now, um, from Austria to Germany, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Italy, Czech Republic. Uh, there are one or two cities now here, also here in the UK. Out of all of them, which one has the most markets to choose from? 
I would say Germany probably has the most. I think they have about 70 to 80 Christmas markets across the towns and cities. Uh, the beauty of the German markets is that all of them are slightly, uh, slightly different in the way that they're presented or in their appeal. Okay. Which German city has the most popular market out of all that lot? Uh, Dortmund and Cologne, uh, probably the largest. Um, Cologne also has the interest of a floating market on the Rhine and um, it also plays host to the largest Christmas tree in the Rhineland. Being German, some people might have trouble pronouncing the names. Do you have any tips for people? It does depend on the market and which one you're struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, if in doubt, you can always check on the internet to look at the, uh, the pronunciation. Um, but if you go on one of our tours, then your onboard crew will be able to uh, help you with the pronunciation and local knowledge and tips of where to go and where not to go. That's handy. People who listen to my show know I always manage to mess up one or two words, mainly the English ones, unfortunately. <laughs> In terms of food and drink, what are the must-buys at a German market? Well, I think that probably the best known is the mulled wine, which is also locally known as Glühwein. Uh, Stollen, which is a rich German fruit and nut loaf gingerbread, hot roasted nuts, waffles, uh, and of course, if you, if you are in Germany, uh, bratwurst. But unique festive gifts such as hand-painted baubles, candles, jewellery, knitwear, and much more are nice keepsakes uh, to, to bring back from those places. We've already mentioned about pronouncing the names of the markets. I've recently been in Italy and I don't speak any Italian, so I struggled a little bit. But at a Christmas market, would somebody who just speaks English like me have any problems? I would say not. I mean, the, the markets have thousands of visitors, um, a lot of them uh, coming from the UK, and the stall holders, most of them speak enough English, especially when you're trying to buy something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's handy. I'm, I'm quite well versed in pointing. Yeah. If you have children, which markets would they enjoy the most? Uh, I think Nuremberg would be perfect as a host uh, for a for, as a host of the children's Christmas market, it has a, an old-fashioned carousel, Ferris wheel, steam train, a lot of things that younger children that that appeals to younger children. It also has a nativity scene uh, trail, which runs between the two markets. And on the other end of the scale, if it's a romantic trip, which is the best location if you want a little bit of romance? Ooh, uh, I would say we have a, a tour that goes to Brussels and uh, Bruges. Mm -hmm. That would be perfect. In Brussels, a very cosmopolitan city, uh, brought to life with local musicians, painters, jugglers. Whereas Bruges, a beautiful medieval town with cobbled streets and a, a network of canals. It's perfect for those romantics amongst us who like to wander around. Plus, with a stay in a five-star hotel, mm -hmm. you know, what more could you really want? Yeah, that's true. What about you? Do you have a particular favourite? I have a couple, but I guess my real favourite will have to be... Um, the one that we go to on our Falkenberg tour. Mm -hmm. The markets there are unique. They're set in the Gemeintegrot caves that were excavated in the town in the Roman times. The illuminations and decorations in the grottos create a wonderful atmosphere. They really are something different. And we've mentioned you work for Ledger and you offer tours to Christmas markets. Which is the most popular one that Ledger do? Uh, good question. I would say probably Cologne. It offers seven Christmas markets, uh, nativity scene displays, huge ice rink. It offers great value, starting from only £169 for a three-day break. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to go there for a little bit longer, a uh, four-day break starts from 209 And the beauty of Cologne is it's, it's such a large city, but there's a fantastic Altstadt, old town, to go out as well once you've done the markets. With your multi-centre co coach tours, how much space is available for travellers to bring stuff back? Because being in the EU, they don't have to worry about allowances, do they? Uh, no, they don't, except it, it does have to be for personal use. Mm -hmm. And, of course, on any type of transportation, you're limited as to how much you can bring back, uh, mainly because of the space available. But it's never been an issue, um, especially in our silver service vehicles, uh, providing not wanting to bring the kitchen sink back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some might assume these coach tours are for pensioners. Is that the case? Um, I would say not. I mean, we, we appeal to, especially Christmas markets, a real broad range of, uh, of, of customers, uh, from couples, mothers, daughters, groups of friends. It's a great time of the year to go away for a short break, uh, but it's also a good time for people to get together, and there's nothing better than going in a small group. No. It does sound a lot of fun. But how do listeners find out more about your trips? 
Most of our European Christmas market tours run from November to December. Uh, we start making bookings uh, 12 months to 18 months in advance. Mm-hmm. And most of our tours uh, offer an upgrade to our luxury silver service coach, which includes extra leg room, reclining seats, personal entertainment, a lovely rear lounge, plus much more. And nine out of our ten of our guests choose silver service, so it's always best to book early to make mm-hmm. sure you're not disappointed. Um, what you could do is look on our website, which is www.ledger.co.uk, and we've got a wide selection uh, of tours for you to go out, or just ring us and request a brochure. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks for your time. Hopefully we've uh, encouraged a few listeners to go away. Um, they may think it's the wrong time of year to talk about this sort of thing, but as you mentioned, they, they can book up early, so uh, thank you. It's actually interesting because the... Um, you know, we've, we've already got a lot of people booked already, mm-hmm. but as soon as we get past the sort of end of August when the schools are back, we uh, you know we get a lot of people booking Christmas market tours and Christmas tours. This is Seclo Sounds. Join us every Wednesday at 7 p.m. for one hour in the company of Harry and Edna on the wires, exploring all aspects of the vintage scene and playing tip-top gramophone tunes. Harry and Edna on the wireless, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. on seclosounds.org. Jolly good. You can contact us or just keep up to date with travel news at facebook.com slash Travel Show. This is Seclo Sounds, your community radio station. If you'd like to volunteer some of your time and skills with Seclo Sounds, send an email to volunteers at seclosounds.org and let us know how you would like to be involved. MK Flyers Online, the fast and simple way to find any kind of business or service locally. Find us at mkflyersonline.co.uk or download the MK Flyers mobile app from your app store. MK Flyers Online proudly supports Seclo Sounds, community radio for Milton Keynes. The John Green Travel Show. Checking it out before you check in on seclosounds.org. There's just the one news story on the travel show this week. So, here's a story about another unhelpful survey with massive holiday headline potential. In fact, I've read quite a few stories based on this particular story that go on about holiday fines for parents taking children out of school during term time, but I've yet to find any information that actually lists figures for parents taking kids out of school during term time for holidays, if you know what I mean. So new research from the BBC has revealed a 70% increase in fines that have been issued to parents whose children have missed school. The BBC had replies from 118 English councils and it found that 64,000 fines have been issued since the law changed in September 2013. These figures do include fines for truancy or poor attention records and the original BBC article which I found assumed, maybe correctly, maybe incorrectly, that the majority of these fines were for taking a holiday during term time, a practice which the government has determined to crack down on since the start of uh, this last academic year. The new regulations has meant that school heads can no longer grant 10 days holidays in special circumstances, but they can still allow extended leave for more than 10 days in exceptional circumstances. I have contacted one local authority, who actually didn't respond to this report, about families with parents in armed forces, because, well, they really don't have any choice about when they take their holidays. And it's hardly fair to penalise somebody when they say that they have to work to a rigid timetable or a tour of duty. But anyway, this particular local authority said that they would be looked on favourably. Don't tell the police, because the Police Federation wants special treatment for police officers too. But it did make me wonder about schools near military bases. Sometimes they must have half full classrooms. Well, back to the BBC report. Uh, the results show that English parents were issued with 63,837 fines. This was nearly double the 37,650 fines issued the previous academic year. From those that replied to the BBC, the penalty kings were Lancashire, which had the biggest increase in fines at 176%, with 
which meant 3,106 cases. I've since learnt that each parent is a separate case, so if mum and dad still live together, that's two fines. So uh, maybe there's not 3,106 families taking their kids out, maybe it's only 1,500, but uh, that's, that's me wandering a little bit. The top three for numbers of fines was completed by Kent with 2,937, which is an increase of 3%, and Leicester with 2,728, and Leicester's figures near enough matched last year's. There wasn't a north-south divide when it comes to fines, as increases were seen across England. If you're a parent, you may want to consider moving away from West Sussex, where 2,403 fines, which represented a 146% increase, or maybe up north Doncaster, which saw 1,464 fines, which was a quite a huge 132% increase. Predictably, when this ban was brought in by the government, it was opposed by parents, with hundreds of thousands signing petitions against these new rules and calling for the government to take action against holiday companies who raised the price at peak times. So parents are fined 60% per parent, as I mentioned, per child per period of absence, which rises to £120 if not paid within 21 days. As a solution, schools may be free to choose their own term times in the future, but that may mean that parents could have children in two different schools with two different dates, so it might cause more problems. There really isn't an easy solution, but personally, I like holidaying during term time because I don't want to be surrounded by other people's children when I'm having uh, when I'm travelling. I like the peace and quiet. The BBC did contact all 152 councils in England, but perhaps the 34 that didn't respond were on holiday. What are your thoughts about this rule? Have you been caught up in it? Have you been fined? If you have, please, if you feel free, feel like you want to, please share your story with us at facebook.com slash John Gwyn Travel Show. Or maybe you're happy that children can't t- travel in term time because it means peace and quiet when you go on your holiday. Again, facebook.com slash John Gwynn Travel Show. Happy Radio! Hi, this is Russell Hearn. Join me Fridays at 12 for a little pick-me-up. I'll be playing the music that stirs those warm memories and takes you to a special time and place. And Minnie's here with her choice of fun apps for your phone too. So for a lighter look at life and some songs you'll never forget, tune in to seclosounds.org for some Happy Radio! You can contact us or just keep up to date with travel news at facebook.com slash John Gwynn Travel Show. So I've just been talking about families who have been fined by local authorities for taking their children out of school and the report from the BBC and when it was taken up by everybody else implied that it's people taking their children away for for holidays in term time. As I say, from the reports I've found, I can't prove that one way or the other. But at least these families can afford to go away. There are some families who can't even afford to do that, even for a weekend. And it is important to get away from your environment and go somewhere new to recharge your batteries and learn new things. That's not just me speaking as a travel show presenter or an ex-travel agent or as a travel researcher. We're going to find out now when I speak to John McDonald from the Family Holiday Association that some research has been done and holidays do help children do better at school and to integrate better. So it is important to get away, but what happens if you can't afford it? Well, the Family Holiday Association, they do their best each year to help families or children to get away, even for a weekend somewhere in the UK, just so they can get into a different environment and have some chilling out time and just have some fun. So here's an interview I did with John McDonald late last year, and it's a chance for you to hear it if you haven't heard it before. John, when was the firm Family Holiday Association formed and why? It's an interesting story. It was set up um, by a couple uh, from uh, London uh, in Barnet, uh, Hampstead Garden suburbs. And um, they, it was back in the, the mid-50s. They had had a really tough time. Um, they, they'd, lo- they'd lost a daughter through ill health. 
and um, Pat of uh, Pat and John Lawrence. Uh, Pat had lost his job, so they were, you know, really struggling until um, a friend offered them a cottage down in South End for a couple of weeks, and uh, on condition that they looked after his cat. Mm-hmm. So they, in, back in 1955, they went and had a couple of weeks break down at the seaside, um, and came back feeling that they were uh, much better able to cope and had really benefited from the break. And they decided um, uh, that at some point they would try and help other families experience the same benefits, who, families who couldn't manage to get even the simplest of breaks. And 20 years later, in the mid-70s, um, they set up a small charity, the Family Holiday Association, and uh, started raising money to help local Barnet families to get a break. And it's really grown from there to the point where um, we help over 2,000 families every year uh, from across the UK get simple breaks at the British seaside. Um, Pat Lawrence unfortunately passed away three or four years ago, but his wife, Joan, um, is now 92 and is uh, still part of the North London Friends of the Family Holiday Association Mm -hmm. and, and still raising money for the charity, which is stunning, isn't it? It is, yes. Do you know how many families you've helped since the beginning? It's a rough estimate. Um, it must well. We 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 reckon we've helped about one hundred and fifty thousand people. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, you know over the nearly forty years. Of course, we've grown to two thousand. We haven't helped two thousand families every year. So it must be in the region about uh, thirty thousand families. And thirty thousand families who otherwise wouldn't have got a break, mm-hmm. wouldn't have the memories that we have. Thirty thousand families uh, sounds a great deal, but in fact. That's um, a tiny number compared to the number of families who are affected by this issue. Um, government statistics tell us that uh, one in nearly one in three families is unable to take and afford a one-week break away from home. And there's something like 2.2 million children live in families where they don't even get a day at the seaside. One in three, that sounds an awful lot, doesn't it? I don't realise it was that big a problem. It's huge. Mm-hmm. One in three families uh, with dependent children. Mm-hmm. And um, it adds up to about 7 million people in the UK. How does it work? The charity um, takes referrals from uh, social workers, health visitors, uh, doctors, teachers, uh, other charities like Bernardo's and NSPCC. Um, they refer families to us who they feel could definitely do with a break and um, they only have to fit into fairly simple criteria for us and we'll help them with a break. The, the, the real idea of having people like um, a local health visitor or a school or um, an organization like NSPCC re- referring families to us means that the family also has um, a local support in terms of preparing for a holiday. You and I probably take holidays for granted and mm-hmm. uh, we know exactly what we need to do. We've, we've, we've got the suitcases, we've, we've got the, the flip-flops, uh, but many families who haven't experienced travel, haven't experienced going on holiday, need help in getting ready for, for the break and uh, being able to take advantage of what the break can offer them. So it's much more than just giving them the uh, tickets? Well, we've, we've learned a great deal about um, how we help families over the years, and I think we're quite a sophisticated organization in mm-hmm. providing support. But the support uh, primarily comes from the, the local contact, and uh, we'll help them uh, decide what type of break it is. Family uh, would be offered, be it a day break, be it a short break, be it a week, uh, a week in a caravan. Um, we, and by the way, we own caravans all around the country. Yeah. Yeah, we've got uh, uh, 13 caravans uh, from Air in Scotland uh, to um, uh, Minehead in in uh, uh, and Exmouth in in England. You fund the whole holiday, do the family have to make a part payment? Uh, no, um, we don't ask any financial contribution from families we uh, provide access to accommodation uh, be it one of our caravans or 
be it uh, at a holiday park such as Haven or or Butlins or uh, Pontins Mm -hmm. that will contribute towards transport and we'll uh, add a little bit in extra in terms of a cash support um, for for, for treats. But as I've said, families who have not been on holiday before don't necessarily have all the material that they need to go on holiday with, so they probably do spend a, a bit of money mm-hmm. getting uh, getting on on the holiday that we provide. Um, but you know, it's 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 what the holiday delivers that's the best benefit for for the family. It's the the competencies that families gain by going on holiday. It's the memories that they gain. It's the it's the uh, the, the, the the confidence that uh, a family will, will, will gather. And we, we've worked a great deal with uh, universities to look at the, the benefits of holidays. When, we, when I started at the charity, we were a straightforward philanthropic organization, raising money and helping as many families as we possibly could. Mm-hmm. But since then, what we've tried to do is look at really what are the benefits of holidays and why is it that holidays matter so much and working with universities like Nottingham, Sheffield, Surrey, Westminster we, we've built up a fairly robust case for the, the types of benefits that holidays deliver and I suppose you can put it into a fairly simple nutshell a, a holiday helps build happier, stronger families mm-hmm. and that's great for the children it's great for the parents it's great for the family unit but it also has an impact surely on community as well and in fact we work a great deal with schools and they're an excellent community in which you can see the benefits of children who've previously been excluded from holidays being helped to access a holiday those children becoming um, better pupils um, the, the the parents uh, of those children who previously may have been slightly hostile possibly mm-hmm. to the school becoming allies of the school and as we all know one of the key issues in, in classrooms is low level disruption and all the schools that we work with have found that helping families access a simple break uh, in conjunction with the school makes a real difference to the, the school community um, so holidays matter to families but they matter to the impacts uh, of a holiday can have an impact on not just them but on everybody you're listening to the john gwynn travel show on setclosesounds.org setclo sounds exists to bring people and communities together to celebrate all that's best about the city of milton Keynes. we produce a variety of music and speech programs and you've heard some of the promos in this show and we're produced by local people and run by over 60 volunteers. However, there's always room for more, so if you have a programme idea or a skill that you want to offer, please send us an email to volunteers at seclosounds.org. And of course, as we're all volunteers, we can't operate without the help from our partners, and one such partner is Interaction. Seclo Sounds is based at the old rec- rectory, which is the home of Interaction MK. They're bringing bringing arts to life in Milton Keynes for over 35 years. They use the arts to improve the life chances of disabled people and others in challenging circumstances through shared created activity. Their programs help participants to develop creative, personal and social skills. To find out more, please visit them at www.interactionmk.org.uk. The Shuttleworth Collection Old Warden Bedfordshire invites you to the Flying Proms Air Show on Saturday 16th of August. Gates open at midday. Advance price £32. With groups of 10 or more qualifying for a 10% discount. Book online now at shuttleworth.org forward slash tickets. Then join us for this most spectacular event featuring two Lancasters in full display to a backdrop of classical music performed by the National Symphony Orchestra, followed by the grand finale firework display with flying illuminated models. The Flying Proms Air Show, Saturday 16th of August at the Shuttleworth Collection, Old Warden, Bedfordshire. You're listening to the John Gwynn Travel Show on seclosounds.org. I'm still speaking to John McDonald from the Family Holiday Association. 
We've just covered the history and how the, the association helped families. And now we're going to move on to well, the problem of school holidays taken during school holiday time with the increased costs and also how the association raises their money. You mentioned schools there. Uh, how big a problem is the increased cost of holidays during the school uh, school holidays? Well, yes, uh, the cost of um, school holiday breaks at peak time uh, are in, uh, incredibly high, aren't they? Mm. I think everybody understands that. But, you know, the families we deal with are, are, are banned from holidays at any time because of cost. Yeah. Um, but the point you're making is that um, uh, because of uh, supply and demand, holidays in school holiday time are very expensive. But, you know, in, in England, uh, the Department for Education has just um, rewritten the regulations about uh, access to breaks during term time. Mm-hmm. And it's um, putting a great deal of pressure on families not to take children out of school during term time. Well, of course, it's important that children go to school and learn. But it's equally important to understand that education um, doesn't end in the classroom. Education it can be gained by life experiences mm-hmm. and one of the best life experiences you can have is a break and those families that um, uh, can't possibly afford the peak time holiday uh, can only really look to get a, a break during the term time and schools and the schools certainly we deal with understand the benefits that, that accrue to the family and to the school and I think we've got a bit of a, an argument on our hands with some schools who are uh, more interested in ticking boxes and, um, and banning the idea of people taking children out of school during term time uh, altogether. Do you have any uh, suggestions about term time? To well, a you, you know, not to knock the uh, Department for Education completely. Mm-hmm. They've, um, they're giving schools greater freedom to uh, choose, pick and choose when the, 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 the school holidays are. And um, I think we'll see in the future more spread of school holidays so that um, uh, they gave a great example of seaside uh, towns uh, the schools there um, deciding to to spread their holidays um, a bit uh, wider Mm -hmm. precisely because it's a seaside town and parents are working during the peak holiday period and um, they, it's much easier for them to take their children on holiday out, slightly outside the peak holiday period because they couldn't do it otherwise. So schools are responding to local conditions, which uh, uh, now they have the power to do so. So I think that's really important. But if you look at it, uh, if you look at families who um, are struggling to get a, a holiday, um, and they want to take the children during uh, the peak time, by forcing everybody to take their holidays in that time, there's only one consequence, and the consequence is an increase, further increase in peak time holiday costs. Yep. If a major tour operator was to reduce the peak prices by spreading it out over the year, do you think they would win out in the long term, or was it just too big a step for them to take? <sighs> Um, well, you know, I'm not here to defend the big holiday companies, no. but um, I don't hear of any major companies or any companies making any great uh, profits at the moment. In fact, mm-hmm. they're struggling to control their losses. Um, and as you know, uh, travel agents are, are going out of business up and down the country. It's not because people are ripping families off. It's because um, there's a simple, straightforward formula. They've got so much uh, they've got to sell and they've so much they've got to earn and um, if people are coming to them and asking for holidays at a particular time they'll sell them at a price that allows them to to, to make um, or aim to make a bit of a profit mm-hmm. nobody is coming to them uh, to buy uh, uh, low low season holidays they're all coming to get the, 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 the holidays during when the sun's shining yeah. okay moving on uh How do you get your funding and who are your partners? Uh, The most of our money uh, comes uh, uh, from three main directions. One is from individual donors, people like you and me, 
people who understand that holidays make a difference to to them and to their families and they want to share that around um, we've also got uh, money coming from trusts and foundations who see the importance of helping families and getting families to uh, work better uh, and help children grow up uh, better educated um, and the third area is we're very lucky because we are uh, involved in promoting the idea that holidays matter that people uh, Customers of travel travel companies and, and staff in travel companies uh, do go out of their way to help us uh, either by raising money, by collecting on airlines like Thomson Airways, um, collect money on their airlines, uh, coming holiday makers coming back from their holiday, or from staff running in the London Marathon and, and raising sponsorship for us. Do you hold fundraising events as well? Well, we we'd certainly... Uh, uh, have lots of people running in marathons and the Great North Run, and um, we we tend to let and encourage people and support people to uh, do their own fundraising events. But one interesting one that we've got at the moment uh, that we're supporting um, is uh, William uh, Redaway and and his horse Strider uh, set out earlier this year to travel by on horseback um, to the four corners of England mm-hmm. uh, visiting 30 cathedrals on the way and uh, the ride round England um, has gained a great deal of publicity and um, he, they've even allowed William and Strider to actually ride up into, into the cathedrals Lincoln Cathedral in the summer mm-hmm. they opened up the massive uh, oak doors of the cathedral and allowed the horse right into the, the middle of the cathedral yeah. stunning so um, we, we we want people to help us we need their help we need money to help even more families um, and we, we welcome and support people who will go their way to, to do that on a slightly lighter note or perhaps it's slightly lighter you was at uh, the world travel market and a spade went missing did it ever turn up? The World Travel Market is one of the biggest travel shows that uh, is held, and um, we were very lucky to uh, get access to a stand there. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you may know the the the, the online uh, travel news company Travel Mall. Yes. Uh, very popular uh, for for the the travel industry, and uh, they allowed us to share their stand. And we had a little display there of buckets and spades, and one of our spades went missing. And um, <laughs> you wouldn't imagine that that would be something attractive unless there was a child who happened to be walking around with a dad or mum who was a, a travel agent, and mm-hmm. they, they picked it up. So we made a bit of a, a little story out of it in the travel trade and demanded that, uh, even if it was uh, the cost of a ransom, that we get our spade back. But yeah. it's, it's not shown up. Oh, dear. It might turn up on somebody's beach somewhere. Keep a look out for it. It's, it's very obvious. It's yellow. I will keep an eye out for it. <laughs> What's the association's goals for 2014? Like all charities, what we want to do is to continue our work and uh, continue helping families. And we aim to help, again, well over 2,000 families in 2014 get a, a break at the British seaside. But what we also want to do is to emphasize to everybody that holidays really do matter and that it's not a a luxury it's an essential part uh, that people regard as being a bit of a not a human right obviously because Mm -hmm. there's so many other important things that would be termed as human rights but certainly a social right um, that people should be should be able to access uh, a simple break even if it means uh, just going to the seaside for a day and uh, allowing children to see beyond see beyond the, their everyday horizons. You know, we took uh, a chief executive of a travel company to see a school where we were working. And this uh, chief exec um, was quite prepared for these children never to have been to Mallorca, never to have been on a plane. But the school we took him to was in Hackney in the east end of London. Mm-hmm. And what shocked him was that these children 
had never seen the River Thames. Wow. And he said, well, is it surprising that we have social problems when children live with such restricted horizons? Mm-hmm. That's why you were talking. I was thinking about when I went out on holidays when I was a kid. It was probably the only time I spent time with my dad. And then I was thinking about all the experiences I had, like going into the rock pools looking for crabs and whatever. So yeah, it's, a, it's very important, and you do have a lot of good memories from it. Uh, how can we find out more about the association? The, the, the charity's got a pretty uh, comprehensive website at familyholidayassociation.org.uk, and uh, we've got all the information there that people might want to find. And uh, uh, if people want to contact us regarding holidays, please remember that it's only through referral agents that we take uh, applications um, and that uh, if they want to help us raise money, Mm -hmm. (laughs) they're even more welcome. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, It's a pleasure. Best of luck. Thanks. Well, that's the end of another travel show. I would like to hear from you if you have any information about how you've been dealt with by airlines when it comes to fees, fees for checking in, excess luggage, making changes on your tickets. Maybe you've got away with it and you've had really good service. Share the names of the airlines that have helped you out. Facebook.com slash John Gwynn Travel Show. Likewise, if you've been caught out by these fines, new increasing fines for taking children out of school holidays, or maybe you think having children banned from travelling when you want to travel is a good idea. Facebook.com slash John Gwynn Travel Show. If you want to know more about the Family Association, Holiday Association, then visit their website and you might be able to raise money for them. I think it's a really good cause when I'm doing public speaking. For any fees I'll get will be going towards that because holidays are important, as John from the Association mentioned earlier. But I hope you can join me next time on the John Green Travel Show on setclosesounds.org where every week I'll be checking it out before you check in.
MK Pulse proudly sponsors Seclo Sounds. MK Pulse is Milton Keynes local magazine, bringing helpful information on food, health, fashion, money, travel, culture, and much more to 66,000 readers every month. Plus news, views, and what's on from around the city. If it's happening in Milton Keynes, it's in MK Pulse. And it's available online at www.mkpulse.co.uk. MK Pulse and Seclo Sounds, the heart and soul of the city. 